Okay, I think we're in time. You you can start. All yours. Okay, thank you. So um, today uh, we will be looking into combining machine learning with computational fluid dynamics, basically with OpenFOAM. It's an OpenFOAM workshop. And uh, how to do this using the SmartSim uh, software. So let's just uh, dive into it immediately. So um, what do we basically want to achieve? Um, uh, as an example, uh, here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, we just see uh, like a small uh, CFD uh, problem uh, in open form that's, that's running over some simulation time distributed uh, over four NPI ranks, right? And if you want to do anything uh, with this CFD algorithm in terms of machine learning, we would need to somehow uh, communicate some training data to machine learning models. Um, so, of course, uh, if we want to agglomerate this uh, training data, which is what we hear here, uh, see here in the middle, we would like to do it in a way that uh, we don't slow down the CFD simulation, right? So we do not want to wait, um, uh, so to say, until um, one rank writes the data to start writing from the uh, from another MPI rank. So if you just look at it like schematically, uh, let's assume that we can do this, that we can then uh, agglomerate all the, the data that we need to combine our open form uh, CFD algorithm with some machine learning models. Um, then we will generate like sets of data, right? Sets of input data and output data. So in this case, input data is just something that a neural network here on the right hand side uh, uses um, to perform, perform um, uh, inference. Like these are these red, um, uh, let's say parameters on the left hand side. Uh, in CFD, it can be a point uh, in uh, d dimensional space plus, plus, of course, the time parameter. It can be some physical parameters added here, like viscosity or whatever. And the output can also be some, some physical, um, uh, let's say, vector uh, in this case, because it's now your Stokes equations is going to be the three components of the velocity and, and the pressure value. But it can be any other machine learning model doing any kind of things. Um, so um, this is just kind of like a one directional flow of information, right? So we have on the left hand side CFD. This is decomposed using some um, domain decomposition and message passing. So it's parallelized. Then we have to send this data somewhere. Yeah, uh, We want to send this data in an asynchronous way, and then we want to train some kind of a machine learning model on this data. Now, when we start doing this, so when we start going into training, we will quickly re realize that, well, okay, so the machine learning model just sees data. So if we are sending uh, some, let's say, uh, points uh, and temperature uh, values, the machine learning model is likely uh, not to care if these points are randomly sampled from uh, within the, uh, the solution domain, if they are randomly sampled from some kind of boundary patch or whatever, right? So um, it will just, yeah, work with this data. So usually there's some form of um, data agglomeration happening. Of course, it can happen that your machine learning model is going to separate the loss function into different contributions coming from different parts of your CFD problem still on some level, some, uh, some kind of agglomeration of training data uh, needs to happen. And then this is like something that is more or less standard. So this left to right uh, transfer of information is more or less, uh, I would say all, all, almost common nowadays, yeah, even though the topic is relatively new. But then um, going in the other direction becomes a, a bit, bit more problematic. So if you, if you go in the other direction, if you say, well, uh, now I'm, I'm training my machine learning model on CFD data, and I would like to then use this train model in the same simulation. Now, this is already something that's a bit, okay, hmm, uh, we need to somehow uh, train online and we have to uh, in, uh, inference uh, uh, online, which means that we have to synchronize as well with the CFD algorithm. Because I mean, if we, if we don't synchronize, uh, if you look at this uh, runtime loop on the left-hand side, the simulation will just keep going and the machine learning model will then do what something strange. So um, uh, if the idea is to, at some point, it doesn't have to be time step, it can be some iteration counts, something uh, to synchronize these two parts, um, this needs to be taken into account and it complicates, um, so to say, uh, the workflow. So this is, I would say, one of the, overall overarching um, uh, ideas behind what we what we want to do um, and how to how to do this how to how to achieve this of course we could um, implement all of these things ourselves so we could make sure that we have a place to store our data 
uh, in a way that is scaling in parallel as well um, in terms of increasing the number of, of MPI ranks. Um, uh, all this uh, information regarding synchronizing on the left-hand side, open form on the right-hand side, some machine learning models. This is something that we can all do ourselves. We could also then uh, identify a subset of ranks um, on some uh, computational nodes that will have uh, GPUs available or some additional CPUs available for the training and so on and so on. But um, there's no need to do all this. Yeah, there's already some really pretty interesting software that does it uh, called SmartSim. Um, and this uh, SmartSim uh, software uh, developed by uh, Hewlett Packard Enterpri Enterprise um, provides two things. So first, um, uh, you have this SmartSim orchestrator, which is basically a Python code. It's going to be a Jupyter notebook or some kind of a Python script uh, with a relatively straightforward um, uh, API uh, in terms of like the functionality. So you can really um, easily use it. And this is used for, to implement this computational workflow, meaning, okay, somebody has to start, right, the CFD simulation, somebody has to start, uh, so to say, the, the whatever instance we are going to use to store data, and somebody has to train the model and then make sure that all of these um, uh, information are exchanged. So this is the, the job of the, of the orchestrator. And so luckily, uh, it has a Python uh, interface. Okay, then um, the question is, of course, where do we store our data, right? Because doing this in an example that I've just shown before with uh, 36 points uh, in 2D as a test is not a problem. But if you try to send and receive, um, I don't know, gigabytes of data or something across hundreds or maybe thousands of, of MPI ranks, uh, then uh, doing this in a way that scales is not trivial. And uh, writing your own software for this uh, is also not trivial. So the job of storing this data and scaling uh, the data storage is taken by the Smart Redis database. This is a Redis database, um, uh, and it's going to contain uh, the CFD data sent by OpenFORM, right? Uh, it can contain like a training model, some scripts, um, and you can do this uh, model inference that you need to do, so to say, in this uh, database. Um, and this database as well has a straightforward API uh, in C++, the exclamation marks are there so everyone here who's using C++ and OpenFORM know why they're there. <laughs> Um, and of course, um, in Python. So there's a Python um, connector there. Um, so um, one thing I, I could also note, the, this ecosystem, so the smart SIM and smart Redis ecosystem can be just used uh, also for other software. So if you want to co couple open foam to something else on the right-hand side, instead of like an ML model or multiple ML models, um, this uh, extends very nicely because um, these computational workflows uh, that, that, that are implemented in the, in the uh, SmartSim uh, script uh, are implemented by the yeah, person who is interested in getting things running. So we have the complete freedom um, in um, defining our own workflows. OK, so how does it uh, uh, work under the hood a little bit? I'm not going to go too much into technical details, but I want to say just a couple of things. Um, so um, uh, the idea is uh, to have this in-memory database uh, that, is, can, that can run on GPUs and uh, CPUs as well. It can store scripts, uh, tensors, basically tensor data, AI models, and, and run them. And then on the left-hand side, we can have native um, uh, high-performance codes like OpenFOAM or something else. Uh, you see the languages that are supported. And the uh, entire idea about um, exchange is based on data, which is precisely what, what I kind of like emphasized um, in the... Uh, in the first slide, right? So the uh, the entire idea about connecting, let's say, open form and machine learning model is, uh, let's say, rooted in exchanging data. So this is what this does. Um, uh, data, in this case, um, are some uh, data sets. Um, uh, so sets of uh, tensors that can be exchanged um, or some metadata. So there are then different kinds of types uh, that can be exchanged uh, using the database. Um, and of course, on uh, each side, um, we have to then ourselves, hence the, the, the lightning bolt here, we have to ourselves then implement these data movement strategies. So if we want to connect something to the, um, let's say, the CFD uh, software to a uh, machine learning model, then the CFD software should know um, where uh, to send the information, when to send it within its own algorithm, um, some internal loop uh, count or so runtime plus plus iteration of the time step or whatever, right? So these strategies, the data movement strategies, they have to be implemented uh, by us. And of course, because every, every um, uh, CFD and ML uh, problem is different. Yeah. 
Okay, so what is this uh, useful for? So if you if you look at uh, just uh, you can go through some some user stories. Um, so let's say that we want to perform some post processing while the simulation is running, right? And this is kind of like a usual story in open form. We have the function object functionality, and we just use it to process open form data. Um, let's say the I would call the primary data is the CFD data. These are fields uh, that are used uh, to, to solve PDEs. And then we post-process those fields, get something out like, I don't know, um, pressure drop, whatever, mass flux through a patch or something. And uh, so these function objects, they store this information. They can store it like to the disk. For instance, it's a kind of a usual workflow. And then uh, we can run a Jupyter notebook or Jupyter lab on a high performance computing cluster as a many rank open form simulation is running. And then the, the Jupyter notebook can just you know, quickly go through all the um, data using Python. And then we wrong, which is what we can do either by um, looking at the, the, the signal or by evaluating the signal mathematically, just implementing some quantified, um, like quantified test. Um, as soon as we do this, uh, then um, we can stop the simulation. Yeah, so this is a standard, uh, I would say, um, post online post-processing workflow. Open form runs with uh, MPI ranks, stores some secondary data that are generated by function objects. We use Jupyter notebooks, uh, and then we can stop parameter studies in time and so on and um, work more efficiently and save some uh, joules of energy. Okay, the question is what happens if we put machine learning in between? Yeah, so um, yeah, so now we have on the left-hand side, uh, we have OpenFOAM uh, doing the same stuff it was doing on uh, these different MPI ranks. And then the, the idea is to, okay, now we would need to generate some training data. We need to put it into some kind of machine learning model. PyTorch is here used as an example. And then uh, once we have the machine learning model, I mean, machine learning is a broad field, so we can now do whatever we want. We can either visualize something that we needed machine learning uh, tools or methods to, to process, or we can use uh, the output of the model um, to calculate some deep reinforcement learning reward uh, in, a, in a DRL algorithm, right? It's, it's up to us. And this is where this smart system, a uh, smart sim um, software kind of kicks in, in this case. Uh, because it's, it's generally relatively difficult. This was, a, I think, I held a training last uh, on the last Open Form workshop about uh, uh, compiling uh, Open Form with LibTorch, like with a C API for for PyTorch, and then implementing um, physics informed neural networks directly in there. One can do this. Um, the problem is that if one can, let's say, avoid <laughs> using C for for ML, one should. So this is kind of the, 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 the direction um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe. Uh, because as soon as we uh, use the SmartSim um, uh, software here, so like an open source uh, Python uh, software, we can then say, okay, uh, look, let's send uh, from open form ranks uh, all the information, agglomerate training data. And then now we, we are in Python at this point. So as soon as we are on the ML model side, we are in Python write a short Python script to do some ML number crunching and then do with it whatever we want. Okay, so this would be like one uh, interesting uh, application uh, in this left to right uh, data flow. Um, uh, another one would be uh, online visualization, right? So what we can do and what we are doing uh, with OpenFOAM, we have the sample uh, function object uh, family, so to say, so we can do cuts through our domain, store VTK data um, and just visualize what is going on. Um, but what we can also do, um, uh, we can use uh, leverage uh, smart sim to do this uh, live. So if you have a very large simulation, um, so usually we, we save a lot of computational effort and time by using uh, function objects to do this live post processing, even if we are visualizing some ISO surfaces or something. But um, uh, this also has, a, a, let's say, a, um, point of diminishing return. So if the simulation is really huge, then, then doing this and storing even this VTK data uh, on disk can slow you down significantly. In which case, um, uh, this will another, uh, be another user story for, um, uh, for smarts. So um, in this case, what is happening, so um, basically each uh, open form rank is talking to the Smart Redis uh, database. 
um, because we are just interested in, uh, in visualization in this case, right? There is no need uh, to agglomerate any kind of global training data. So each open form uh, MPI rank um, or MPI process uh, can just visualize uh, or just store, uh, handle its own chunk of visualization data. Um, and uh, this, uh, even though the database is uh, kind of uh, split into shards like pieces, um, it acts as a, uh, as a uniform single uh, entity, which means that uh, once we are storing what, whatever we need to store in the database for visualization, we can visualize um, uh, things live in Paraview in a notebook. Uh, when I say live, I mean like you can see videos of, of data um, being like changed by solving PDEs. Okay, so um, another thing, uh, this one uh, I'm using also, I'm reusing some, some things from previous smart SIM workshops. So this one, I, I wasn't involved this much. So if some questions happen, I wouldn't be able to answer a lot of details, but uh, the idea is quite similar. So you have uh, some uh, separate uh, information being stored, um, uh, machine learning models uh, trained uh, to, to infer um, information about turbulence that can be then reused um, uh, to restart the simulation. In which case, if you are kind of like exa um, examining some parameter space, uh, setting the parameters of your simulation in a way that's data-driven can make it, um, um, let's say, more easy to get faster uh, time to solution in a large parameter study. Uh, but this is what we will uh, look into today uh, in this uh, live training. Uh, so um, this is an example, oh, sorry. So this is an example that um, I'm currently working on. So I took this as an as a, uh, example for the training. And uh, the user story here is, uh, well, I would like to use machine learning for mesh motion, right? So I have mesh moving uh, in a fluid solid interaction in two phase flows um, uh, and the mesh is going to deform in time. Uh, and I would just like to, you know, learn the mesh motion somehow using a neural network or using some other machine learning model. So uh, we are back to this relatively complex case uh, where, as I said before, we have asynchronous uh, parallel uh, agglomeration of data. We have the machine learning model that has to kind of uh, work through this data, train, uh, um, be trained on this data. But then again, um, we actually need online training and inference. Um, and this is when I mean online in this context means um, every time step, which makes it quite um, a complicated example. But I think if we cover this complicated example, then these um, other examples will become uh, really easy for us. Okay, so um, obviously in, in these user stories, yeah, I want to send some stuff somewhere, train some machine learning model, visualize. I want to send some stuff somewhere, train machine learning model. Oh, my model was some kind of a model of an action um, uh, in a, in a, a DRL uh, algorithm. So I would like to calculate the reward. I don't know. So obviously in these, um, in these examples, uh, some data flow patterns uh, emerge, right? So there's from the CFD side, you increase iterations, you send some CFD data, get the model, set the data uh, from the ML model, right? So on the ML model side, you, you, you may increase some iteration. These might or might not be the same iterations, right? Then get some data from the Smart Redis for training, train the model and store the uh, ML model in the database. Or you have these very simple left to right things, right? So simulation ends, you're doing a parameter variation, and you would like to, uh, um, as you are running CFD simulations that cost a lot of time, you would at the same time would like to, um, uh, let's say, map um, your simulation up, uh, output by some kind of a surrogate model. And then the next time when you explore your parameter space, you first use the surrogate model and before you use the, the total CFD simulation because it's cheaper. So in this case, you have this just simple thing, okay? Don't do anything through, throughout the simulation. When end time happens, dump some data to Smart Redis, get it, and then uh, process the data and um, uh, train the model. So um, uh, if, you, if you look at these two uh, cycles on the left-hand side, um, then you will, I mean, it, it looks kind of simple to me. It actually looks simple until I started uh, working on this. Um, uh, the problem is basically that um, there, uh, these, these uh, flow patterns um, and uh, let's say flow charts, they are concurrent, which means um, if, you, if you need some kind of synchronization, uh, you need to basically check in the database if something happens. So this is a bit of a different concept than uh, programming, um, let's say, parallel code in open uh, MPI, where you know, okay, uh, we are synchronizing every time step, yeah, because we are solving a PDE solution from one time step to the next one. We have the domain, domain that is decomposed into subdomains that have boundaries and the messages that are exchanged across boundaries. Or if you have some shared me um, a memory, 
programming model where you're using OpenMP or something, or then you know, okay, I'm accessing all my data. I have to make sure if I use tasks or something that uh, I don't try to, then two tasks don't try to access the same data at the same time. Otherwise, I will have race conditions. So, and this is a, a little bit uh, kind of a different. Um, I would say it's similar to the shared memory programming model because uh, uh, both the CFD side, right, the blue side and the gray side, they're both using the database, right? Although uh, there can't really be any uh, kind of, uh, let's say what you would call race conditions in, in shared memory um, programming because like this left side is writing and the right side, uh, yeah, it can be actually if it's reading before, but this communication is blocking. So that's not a problem. So the problem is here is getting it synchronized um, on the iteration level, right? So um, if I don't check for the data on the gray side, uh, if it's already available in the database somehow, then the gray side is just going to continue cycling, right? So this synchronization is actually done um, uh, using uh, keys, right? So every data that we store, I will get to in the second uh, to the details on how we store it, is associated with some keys. And then basically, if the CFD model dumps something into the database, it's going to assign a key to the data. And then the, the machine learning model, you can just uh, uh, check with the database, hey, uh, is the data there? Is the data there? Like uh, with a specific uh, frequency and a specific uh, duration. Okay, to, to get a bit more concrete on how this works, um, uh, we are kind of, uh, in this case, in this context, lucky that uh, open form fields can be really um, uh, easily interpreted as tensors. So all, all open form fields, starting from field all the way up to geometric fields, um, uh, they are all U-lists uh, because they inherit from U-lists. So the actual storage and the actual data uh, is a kind of a, a wrapped C array, right? So if you look at uh, the actual values that are stored by boundary conditions that are stored by, um, uh, I don't know, uh, internal fields, um, uh, they will be basically uh, interpretable uh, as, um, uh, yeah, uh, C arrays. Uh, in which case, um, uh, this is great because when we want to talk to LibTorch, uh, which is what I covered in the previous training, or in this case, if you want to talk to uh, Smart Redis uh, through the C++ uh, API, Open form provides or open form fields, they provide C data member function so that we can reinterpret uh, a geometric field, which is a complex object, just like as a simple pointer. Um, so this is really making things uh, simple. So uh, now we can go through um, these uh, different, uh, let's say, solutions to the previous uh, user stories that I mentioned, right? So let's say you have a user story saying, okay, I have a solver, the solver uh, as it finishes, should dump the pressure fields uh, into the database. And then I'm going to use a surrogate model and maybe turbulence energy fields um, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the database. And then I want to basically pick these up every time a simulation ends, uh, append this to the training data and train a surrogate model. So if you look at uh, the solver level, so we are now in open form in some solver. This I think is simple form. It's really the, the programming interface is very, very easy to use. So you just initialize the client, meaning uh, open form solver, you are now a client of a smart Redis database. Um, you decide, uh, they decide on the dimensions of the fields you want to send. Uh, so this is relatively trivial. I mean, you know, if you're in a 2D or 3D simulation, if you're going to transfer symmetric tensor or vector of scalar, these dimensions are and of course, uh, the, the, the length of the tensor. So if you're sending the whole cell-centered field, it's number of cells. If it's point field, you know. Right? So, and then uh, putting, the uh, putting the field into the, into the database is just like one command. So even in C++, it's relatively, relatively easy. And um, uh, on the other hand side, somebody has to receive this, right? So on the other hand side, as I mentioned, we have this, uh, let's call it like solver script or runner script or whatever. Um, which is a Python uh, script that's um, implemented using the SmartSim library, Python SmartSim library. Um, uh, we basically define uh, in SmartSim experiments, right? Um, uh, and and uh, we run these experiments uh, in models. So um, an experiment can just execute like a set of models. And um, every, uh, let's say, um, thing that we do in our CFD workflow can be a model. For instance, mesh, uh, create a mesh is a model. Decompose the mesh is a model and run the solver is a model, right? Um, uh, we does, don't have to do this. For instance, I mean, this is just now here like an, as, a, as an example. If there's no really no reason um, that uh, meshing communicates with a smart Redis database, then there's no reason for it to be here as a model, right? Uh, so you can just, uh, if you're on a cluster, you can just first create the meshes of, of all the cases and just like rerun um, uh, the cases without re rerunning meshing every time. Of course, this would make no sense. This is a small example. 
So um, yeah, so basically, um, uh, if we focus now a little bit on the on the solver, so we have the solver now as a model, and uh, it has some run settings, and then SmartSim is going to run this uh, this model. And in this case, uh, it's going to run the model in a way that that it blocks, so the the, the next so to say uh, calculation is not going to start before the previous finishes. In this case, obviously, if we mesh, we should mesh the problem first before we run the solve. So as you see, like starting these starting open form simulations from the smart uh, sim um, uh, side is also not that uh, complicated. Okay, so if you look at something like a function object, so this is just a, a code snippet. We will look into the code uh, of all these problems. Uh, I think in ten minutes approximately. So um, if you look at a function object, so this function object uh, okay, uh, just uh, basically um, accepts a list of field names. Um, and a list of, of, of field dimensions, so to say. Uh, oh no, we didn't say no, it doesn't need field dimensions, as you see. So it, you give it like a list of field names, and um, um, uh, this will just find the field, uh, look up the field in the mesh, so to say, uh, using the field name, um, and uh, it will figure out, uh, so to say, the, the dimensions. Um, uh, and of course, then it will put the, put the tensor field, so to say, into smart threads, which is the final command. It's funny because I, I wrote the function object. I should know <laughs> what it does. Okay, so um, okay, and then if you look at the function object script, or let's say the snippet of this function object script, so we are now running the simple form solver, right? But this is, I mean, we could run any other solver. It's a function object, right? So uh, um, uh, it can attach uh, to any open form solver, right? And the function object itself will do exactly what the simple form solver was doing in the previous example. It will open a channel to the database. So every MPI rank will open a channel to the database and dump some stuff into the into the database. Okay, and um, since we were talking about machine learning um, uh, models being used for um, post processing, so live post processing, now you have everything in Python, right? So at this point, you, we have gotten some fields, um, and then we can just apply uh, some. I mean, below in this code, we we'll look at it later. We are using singular value decomposition. We can do some other things train a neural network on the fields or whatever. The point is that this kind of like synchronization and, and data input and output is taken care of um, for us. But note this, these are very trivial. I mean, these are not trivial, they're very simple, um, simple workflows going left to right. You always just know that the data is there. You can just read it and process it. Yeah, then what we are going to do in the example is a bit more complicated. And now we come to the example, right? So. Um, Online ML mesh motion. So let's let's first talk about the problem setup. So um, imagine you have this, uh, let's say, mesh uh, or let's say a problem in open form with a mesh that moves and deforms. And the blue dots that you see are the blo dots uh, points that are sampled from the open form um, boundary mesh. So uh, there's a cylindrical, it's of course, it's a tutorial test case, so it's simple. So you, we have like an, a cylinder, which is a hole in the open form mesh, right? And we have the outer boundary, which is a square with a bunch of points. So the uh, outer boundary displacements are zero displacements, and you can see these displacements um, uh, associated to the blue points of the cylinder. And the idea is, um, um, given these Dirichlet or like fi fixed value conditions for the mesh motion, in this case, these displacements delta, yeah, approximate the displacements throughout the solution domain. So I would like literally, if I click with my mouse randomly somewhere here in there, I would like to have this delta tilde, right? The approximation of the displacement in there in such a way that the conditions are satisfied. Yeah, meaning if I evaluate the same approximation at the boundary that I don't get totally crazy values. I don't have to get exactly the values that are um, uh, available here at the boundary, but they must be very, very similar. Yeah, we can discuss later on, on uh, why it's an interesting question. Um, uh, so, so we want to have accuracy near the boundary. It doesn't have to be floating point precision accuracy. It, it needs to be accuracy to a couple of, of percent because we will not use these displacements. Yeah, so when you move the mesh, you, you basically move the boundary points. Um, uh, given um, by the displacements coming from the solid solver solution or by some kind of an exact solution of um, a solid body motion, right? So, sorry, elastic body, right, and solid body, okay? So uh, these displacements are given. And then if we approximate the delta tilde using these displacement, displacements, we will evaluate delta tilde within the domain. We will not evaluate them on the boundary. 
So um, the difference uh, may be um, between the boundary um, uh, displacements uh, that are given as training data and the stuff that's given uh, out uh, using uh, inference, um, there might be some small difference we accept. Okay, so um, why not just use um, uh, Laplacian mesh motion? I mean, um, this is just an example. It's what we are currently working on. It might be, it's a research question. <laughs> so it might, not, might be that we are wrong, but uh, if you look at um, PDE-based uh, based, uh, mesh motion, like the Laplacian mesh motion, you are actually solving um, the Laplace equation with some diffusion coefficient for the displacements, given some Dirichlet boundary conditions on the boundary. Yeah, uh, Meaning, like, I give you the displacements here at the cylinder, you know that the displacements at the outer boundary are zero, and you solve a Laplace equation for it, which is super fast, it's really cool. The question is then, okay, uh, ooh, I need to somehow decide on this diffusion coefficient. Usually an inverse distance from this moving boundary is working quite nicely, but not always. Uh, but uh, one more problem is uh, more kind of distinctive is that um, uh, basically this PDE for the displacement motion is solved on a deforming mesh. So yes, I mean, this the, uh, the example of the left head side is a bad example. I just have used something to check if the framework is running because it has a high non-orthogonality at the beginning. I, I would usually mesh this with CF mesh with some boundary layers near the cylinder and have a dominantly hexahedral mesh with not so much non-orthogonality, but that's not the point. Even if you would have a really great mesh on the left-hand side, really, really great, slow non-orthogonality, when we start deforming, the mesh, the non-orthogonality will increase, which means that we are uh, retroactively um, uh, deteriorating the um, uh, accuracy of the PDE-based solution for mesh displacements. Because if you deform the mesh, increase mesh orthogonality, go back into the Laplace equation solution, the equation solution will be worsened because the finite volume mesh errors will be worsened. Okay. And um, so why, why would we then use machine learning? Well, because uh, approximation or interpolation-based uh, mesh motion is smoother, right? So the errors that we get by solving PDEs for mesh motion are going to be proportional, or let's say they're going to be polynomial um, in the discretization, like so delta x to the power of p, if we are lucky to the power of two, because we have second order accurate finite volume method. But uh, they will also you know, be different, obviously, because the, they are, the non-orthogonality is non-uniform yeah, in, in, the, in the case. And um, uh, they will be uh, introducing a lot of noise because delta x is, yeah, it's, changing on an unstructured mesh. And so, so is the field derivative. These interpolation-based methods, they don't care about the discretization. They say, okay, give me the boundary displacements as input. I will do something yeah, that will approximate or interpolate uh, within the domain. And then depending on how this approximation problem is formulated, you can get really, really smooth um, approximations. And we are not the first ones to do this. There was an earlier work um, uh, from Hester Biel and uh, I think it was Frank Tabor. Um, um, on um, uh, mesh deformation using radial basis function interpolation, uh, where they show that you can, like, if you use interpolation with RBFs, you can get crazy um, deformation of the mesh. Okay, so um, what do we want to do? Uh, we don't want to use RBFs. Uh, we would like to uh, do, just keep this model free, so to say, right? So we would just say, okay, let like, you can just use any model uh, because it's Python and you can you can easily uh, build different models. So um, what to do um, about uh, the first step, right? So the first step is uh, to look into the open form data structure, right? Not data structure in terms of like a linked list or something, data structure in terms of how fields in open form are structured. Because you have to get, go from, from the, these um, geometric fields and boundary information into the machine learning model. And there are some caveats uh, to be aware of, uh, not just for mesh motion, but in general when, when, when you know, using machine learning on boundary data in open form. So I, that's why I made the slide. So let's assume that this, this left-hand side is working. Then um, um, we can just say, okay, each MPI rank uh, is sending the data to the Smart Redis database to increase efficiency that they're concurrently writing. Uh, one thing is like, we really don't need MPI process boundary data. So if you're working with boundary data in open form, you usually loop over the boundary field. Uh, you don't need MPI process boundary data. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would say in 99% of the cases, it's not necessary. Uh, we also don't need empty patches if you have a two-dimensional problem, like in this case, in this example, uh, because they're, they have zero length. Um, uh, another thing is uh, what I found interesting uh, in doing this is uh, if you look at point fields uh, in open form, so if you go over the boundary, um, uh, you will have a list of all boundary patches uh, with zero length for patches that are not present at the MPI rank. 
And if you start or want to store a zero length um, a tensor to Smart Redis, then you get, uh, of course, an error. So um, uh, this is something that's also just for open formers. It, I think it's important to have the slide somewhere. Okay, and uh, so what is then being sent? Yeah, so um, uh, what do we want? Yeah, we want boundary points and boundary uh, displacements, right? So um, uh, these, these boundary points and boundary displacements, if we are looping over the boundary, and if we take into account these points that I just mentioned, yeah, they are going to uh, have um, a kind of like, a, let's say a structure. Yeah? So we are either sending points or we are sending displacements. We are sending them from a specific patch. We are sending them at a specific time step because we need to synchronize the training between the machine learning model, um, uh, uh, so to say, synchronize the machine learning model training and time stepping there and the time stepping the CFD simulation and we have MPI ranks, okay? So um, great, so now we have won in terms of uh, efficiency, but we have lost in terms of complexity. We have won in terms of efficiency, efficiency, as I said, because you can write in parallel to the database. So um, now if you look at these, um, um, so to say, uh, of tensors that are being written, sorry, this should be um, uh, tensors, not, not um, uh, uh, data set. So uh, these tensors, so you, you will get point patch time step rank, displacement patch point and time step rank. And like imagine, just uh, imagine you have a complex CFD case with like 30 different uh, boundary conditions, like you have a, um, a burner, like you have a, a gas burner that has uh, 48 outlets or something, um, and you're training there and you're training this over like 50 MPI ranks. Now you can imagine the length of these, I mean, the number of these things, the number of tensors that are being sent and received. And um, how can we then, for such a large set of, of tensors, uh, check uh, if the data is available in Smart Redis? So we can't and we don't want to. So what we then do is we, we agglomerate everything into data sets, right? So you go from the tensor level to the data set level and saying, okay, look, the entire simulation is just going to go over all patches that are non-zero for a time step zero and for an MPI rank, and then send the points data set. Same with displacements. And then we can go like um, uh, into a, a, a one more, um, so to say, aggregation list, um, a higher, so one, one level higher into the aggregation lists and say, okay, now we also want to, let's say, list the data sets and agglomerate them over time steps, right? And so, so because it's Friday, it's the last day. I don't know if anyone's awake here, it's a virtual session. Um, that can anyone tell me, okay, if we, if we now say we have agglomerated over the patches, uh, we have agglomerated over the ranks, right? And we know the time index. Uh, how can we know if all the data from the current time step is available in Smart Redis? Uh, just raise, raise hands if you are brave. I can look into the participants. Or write in the chat, maybe even better, so that we continue to keep the time. Write in the chat. Um, I'll... Wait for 30 seconds. Okay, so um, to continue and to keep the time, well, basically, um, you know um, that uh, the, the total number of these uh, data sets is going to be proportional to the product, it's going to be equal to the product of the time, time index and the number of MPI ranks, right? Because you go from the, you go in the agglomeration from the patch um, uh, to, the, uh, to the rank, and then finally to the time index. And you can see, okay, this is now the first point uh, where we are talking about um, uh, synchronization in terms of receiving data. And you can see how this is done, right? So um, uh, just like if you're writing some non-blocking uh, MPI code, you have to, uh, uh, wait until something has finished or check uh, if the data has been received. Uh, uh, the same thing here, um, you basically pull um, uh, the database and ask, okay, look, uh, take 10 milliseconds uh, for a thousand times um, and uh, check if the list of all the data set uh, lists, so to say, for the displacements is equal to the time index time, uh, the number of MPI ranks. And this number, I mean, this is going to be a lot of time to wait for. So, of course, this is the maximum uh, wait time. You can write a large number here, and it's going to return as soon as you, uh, as soon as the uh, the length has been updated. Um, and then, um, because we are like pressing for time, I won't ask you <laughs> anymore. So the question is like, is there anything else? So now we synchronize, so to say, with uh, uh, synchronized in terms of data. Well, we have to synchronize in terms of time. Yeah? So we have to synchronize time steps. 
So how do we do that? Well, uh, when the CFD simulation finishes, um, one MPI rank should just write into this uh, Smart Redis database, A, hey, we reached end time. And then, of course, every time in every iteration on the Python side, uh, we poll for this uh, end time index key and um, uh, ask the database, hey, uh, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? And as soon as we are done yet, uh, we exit the iteration loop, so to say, um, training and, and data receiving iteration loop on the Smart Sub side. And um, basically, that's it. So um, we can now look a bit into the source code just to show you how this looks like. Um, so we can go first through the um, displacement uh, solver that we are developing currently. So it's just a basically like, um, um, we call it like displacement uh, smart sim motion solver. Uh, it inherits from the displacement motion solver. It uh, has this uh, client uh, um, attribute um, uh, that uh, uh, it will initialize in its constructor. Um, to open the uh, connection to the database. And uh, it just implements uh, two, two member functions that are necessary to uh, change the displacements. Uh, but this is the most relevant part. So basically when we go into the data exchange, the reason why this code is a bit longer, it's 150 lines in open form is because we have to loop through all these boundaries and then exclude some things that, that are either empty in terms of the empty boundary condition or zero length um, patches. Uh, the code that we actually need to, to, to communicate to smart thread is, is, is really very short. So, um, okay, that's basically get the boundary mesh, uh, get the time index, the runtime, uh, so that we can um, uh, also, uh, let's say, denote the names of the da data sets. And this is just now the data, data crunching. Right, so we are now going into um, the boundary field uh, like this, right? And then we, we are skipping some empty patches. We are skipping processor patches in this case. I have still some fix me's and to do's um, uh, to take care of here. And then um, what we basically do is, um, yeah, uh, send this data here below. We just send the data to um, Smart Redis. So we are um, sending the, 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 adding the tensor. So we are first adding the tensors to the data sets. Then we are sending the data sets to Smart Redis. And then we are appending these data sets to the ag aggregation lists that I, was, I, was, I mentioned before. And then um, uh, once this is done, um, we check if the model has been updated. If it hasn't been updated after polling, this means we cannot use it, so we have to exit. Um, and apart from this, uh, we just set, uh, so to say, the uh, end flag once the simulation has uh, finished um, uh, running on the, on the open form side in the smart release. And on the Python side, um, you basically just have this um, short, um, relatively short um, Jupyter notebook uh, where, I mean, currently we are using just a multi-layer perceptron uh, to train the, the, the data. Um, we are doing some, some sorting of the names. Uh, we need this, uh, we need to sort these data sets um, with, uh, with respect to the MPI ranks, because as I mentioned before, they will be uh, agglomerated and added asynchronously. That's MPI. Yeah? And, and you want to make sure that um, uh, you are uh, kind of associating the displacements um, of a specific patch from a specific MPI rank to, um, uh, so the points and displacements of a specific uh, patch uh, and a specific MPI rank must match. So, and since we are storing this information in their names, we just have to sort them, that's it. Okay, and then we, we run the experiment. I can run it uh, live now to see how it crashes live. It's usually the case <laughs> for me, but uh, you see, like basically it just over, goes over time steps, um, uh, creates a multi-layer perceptron, uh, receives uh, the data beforehand from smart Redis, uh, trains the multi-layer perceptron and uh, does forward inference. And that's that's, basically basically it so um i would just first uh, finish the talk and because i would like to leave more time for discussion at least uh, 10 minutes so i will just jump back to the slides and then if there are any questions i would love love to go through the uh, the details of the code um with you okay so so the code is as i said it's relatively straightforward so you know open the channel send some data uh, uh, or, or let's say create data sets agglomerate um uh, uh, tensors into data sets and then uh, list all the data sets in a long list. On the Python side, check the list length, fetch the data, train a machine learning model in Python, and do the inference. Okay, so um, obviously, um, 
based on what I just discussed, we, we, we looked into a solver, we looked into the function object, uh, uh, we looked into the mesh motion solver. Um, uh, there's also, of course, a pre-processing utility, which maybe sounds easy, but if you have some experimental data that you would like to extrapolate uh, uh, in your CFD domain or using your CFD domain, then it's also nice uh, to have such a workflow running. So you see there are some minimal working examples and we are currently working on uh, in the uh, open form data driven, uh, I never know if it's like a special interest group or a technical committee, we are working on um, preparing these and we will put them into an open form smart sim module relatively soon. So you can, if you're interested, you can just pick up the module and say, ah, okay, I will take this function object, look how it works, and then I can replace maybe in a Python script the existing model with the model that I need and replace the data uh, retrieving and sending with the data that I need and so on. Um, if there are any suggestions to this, um, any examples you would like us to add or something, um, yeah, you can mention it in the, in the comment round or contact me per email and uh, join the data-driven um, modeling committee. Um, which is what it brings us to the to this, I would say, final slide. Um, so uh, yeah, join us. I mean, uh, we are actively working on these things, not just this. We are also working on deep reinforcement learning in open form, uh, physics in form, machine learning um, uh, in open form. And we are quite an active, uh, yeah, we're actually, we are SIG, quite an active SIG. Um, uh, we have a Slack channel that you can uh, check out. And uh, there's an invitation actually on the open form wiki. If you just click on it, you will just become a member. Um, and uh, go to through GitHub, uh, look at what we did so far, uh, and give us some stars um, for the for the effort. And now I would like to open, um, if it's possible, the Q and A, uh, so that we can maybe interact a little bit. Um, so where can I check for questions? Maybe forward the question to Thomas Love. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the session chair left, I guess. Okay. So I, I would just uh, forward uh, the questions in case there are any. So, okay. Okay, there's one question. Yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, Thomas Love, if you already have some idea about how well this scales, for example, if you go to like a thousand MPI ranks. Um, yeah, uh, if it's like scales really well, uh, I didn't put this example in there, um, but um, I can actually, I mean, I can search maybe for the origin, I can put it later on in the, in the, in the chat uh, or somewhere on Uva. So there's uh, um, an article where this was already used for climate modeling. Um, and uh, it wasn't used with open form. It was used by, by an ocean uh, modeling software and climate modeling software uh, and machine learning. And this was done with, on, of, with thousands upon thousands of, of course. So also heterogeneous systems, like when you want to combine um, uh, GPUs uh, or multiple GPUs with many, many, many CPUs, um, this scales. I mean, if you just look at, I, I mean, I would just short answer is if you just look at who, who coded it, it's like Cray Labs programmed this, so it's, it's scaling. It would be my, my short answer to this. More questions? Uh, so the question is, if you could explain again quickly what the features and the labels are of ah. this machine learning problem here. Ah, yeah, sorry. So maybe I was too quick. So um, basically, um, uh, yeah, this is a, my, I'm still this terminology with features and labels. This is, so, I mean, um, I look at it like as a, as a approximation problem, right? So um, uh, the input to my model, I think I would guess features in this case, um, would be, uh, Andrew, you'll have to correct me again. <laughs> so, I mean, I want my model to train um, uh, and learn displacements. So uh, if uh, I think the features would be the displacements, right? So um, uh, the, 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 the difference between the, the displacement, the output of this delta tilde 
And these uh, arrows that you here uh, see on the cylinder and the zero, uh, zero length vectors here on the boundary is what defines my loss function, okay? And the input X are the blue points, okay? I don't know if it's, so, right? So I, 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 want, I want some function, some approximation uh, that takes uh, these blue points as arguments and uh, gives me back um, these, these uh, arrows, right? So um, uh, the errors are non-zero here at the cylinder because the cylinder is a solid body that rotates and translates. And I have zero displacements on the boundary of my domain. So, the, so that, that's why you don't see any vectors on the boundary, right? So no, no errors there, there's zero length. I hope it this answers. I always mix up these features and whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Or so, so, so basically, the features are uh, x and y, the coordinates of the points, right? And what you try to predict is uh, the displacement in those points. Yes. Which, yeah. which, which Thomas Love here indicated uh, by means of arrows. Yeah. And I think, like, I, probably the red arrows are the the, the the labels the actual targets and green is the prediction or the other way around they're yeah, pretty yeah so so yeah the, the green I think the the, the green one uh, is the so I can maybe zoom in a little bit I don't know if you can see this so I mean the the green ones are the ones that are prescribed and the red ones are the ones that are uh, given by the approximation by this multi-layer perceptron that we are using currently so it's it's a smooth field because it's uh, coming from solid body motion there isn't any noise it's coming from an ODE so we can quite nicely approximate. I just wanted to emphasize that we don't need to be this accurate uh, in, in, in approximating these displacements. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, maybe do you have a picture of the displacement field? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is something <laughs> I had at the beginning, but uh, I forgot to add it at the end. So this is what you get. So I can, yeah. So this is like for this small example, you have like a uniform displacement, displacement field um, from that you can use for mesh motion throughout your domain. So these black arrows um, uh, that you see here uh, are going to be used to displace um, corner points of cells, or let's say mesh, po mesh points in the, in the CFD simulation. Uh, the question is if it also works for vari variable time steps. Yeah, yeah, that was the main problem, so to say, um, here. So uh, if I go to, to the Python part, so um, you can see, I mean, um, currently I'm not uh, uh, still doing inference. This is like a work in progress, as I mentioned. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize this example. And uh, what I found, find, found by doing it, it's the most complicated thing in terms of the workflow um, that, that I guess I could have chosen. Uh, so um, yes, it's, it's going to synchronize across time steps. That's what you see here. So you basically start in Python um, uh, by uh, some local time index. I could just call it local time index because it's a local to the Python script, right? Um, and uh, we start with the time index one. Open foam starts with the time index one, right? It is going to move the mesh, so to say, um, uh, create a, a sense, or uh, not move the mesh, we're going to create a set of these displacements, send these displacements to the Smart Redis database, right? and uh, also send their corresponding points to the Smart Redis database. Now we are in Python, we have no idea about the time step in open form. I mean, we are in, it's not open form, it's Python. So the only way for us to actually step synchronously with open form is uh, to, to, to using uh, this check that says, okay, um, please query the database and make sure that the database um, contains these displacement lists that are as long as local time index time the, times the number of MPI ranks. And I, I know that this, this, this length is uh, uh, of this size, so to say, because of the structure of the open form data that I'm sending. I could also do something else, right? I could go to open form and I could say, okay, um, let's see, please um, here, look, uh, as soon as uh, uh, you can, yeah, open form, please write your current time index. Yeah, you, you know, we are now in open form. We have access to runtime. We know which time index we are in. And I can say, write the time index. And then go back to Python. This would be a bit simpler way, I guess. And then go back to Python and say, uh, look, um, go into the Smart Redis database and wait at this point 
until you find a time index in the database written, which means that I'm synchronizing, so to say, CFD solution uh, with this uh, machine learning training on the Python side on the time, um, time index, or let's say runtime plus plus or time increment level. This is how, how we are doing it. So there are many ways of how to do this. You can, that's the kind of the charm of this thing is that this is the workload that I chose for my problem. But how you couple these things and on which level do you couple? Do you couple, do you let open home run over the whole time step um, uh, and then maybe synchronize every five time steps here on the Python side? It's up to you what, what you want to do. Uh, the, the, the way you synchronize is by checking, always checking the database for some information. So you can also just go to, to, to uh, open form and says, okay, um, uh, this is like writing the current time set, but you can just say, uh, um, let's say, end uh, runtime time index value, uh, maybe a modulus 10 equals zero. And then this is going to just basically say every 10 time step, make sure that the Python is synchronized with open form. It's it, you, you are designing the workflow yourself, so to say. I hope it answers the question. Yes. Um, more questions? Does not seem the case. So uh, let's thank Thomas again for his training. Thanks. <laughs>